Well, it's great to be here again, and I, I'm honored and humbled by the opportunity to bring you God's Word on, on such a wonderful, glorious, amazing, mysterious, and beautiful doctrine as providence. And tonight, my task is actually to set before you a definition of providence and say something about the beauty of providence. And that's a, a wonderful task. Thursday morning, I'm to speak about the Heidelberg Catechism, some of its history, and uh, how the Catechism treats providence. My problem, as I began to deal with both subjects, is that the Catechism mostly is defining providence. And it also talks about the beauty of providence. And it talks about how providence has played out in our lives. So it does both. So I thought, well, I'm going to end up just repeating myself both times from different angles. So in the end, I settled on defining providence in the context of the Heidelberg Catechism. That's why you got handed out questions 26, 27, and 28 this evening. I want to look with you especially at 26 and 27, defining it, showing its beauty. And then Thursday morning, we want to look at how it impacts us in personal advantages from question 28. Now, of course, there are different ways of looking at providence, defining providence. One way is to use object lessons to tell stories, because providence, after all, is God operating in history, God fulfilling the story of his eternal decree. Providence really is his execution of his eternal decree in time. Those stories can be told going forward, but as John Flavel famously said, providence is like reading Hebrew, sometimes it's best read backwards. So let me give you both a forward-looking story and a backward-looking story before we get into a a more doctrinal uh, distillation of providence so that you get an understanding before we do it doctrinally that this has everything to do with our daily lives, and with God's marvelous working in our society, in our churches, in our families, and in our own souls, in our own warp and woof of daily living. John Craig, a colleague of John Knox in Scotland, was converted in God's providence through reading a copy of Kelvin's Institutes that somebody slipped to him when he was in a convent of the Dominicans as a monk. He then was uh, persecuted for his faith, seized as a heretic, carried to Rome, and condemned to be burned. On the evening prior to his being burned, the Pope died. And it was a custom at that time when the Pope died that the doors of the prison would be thrown open for 24 hours. And everyone but the heretics was allowed to leave. Well, in the providence of God, there was so much tumult as the doors were thrown open that one of the jailers also opened the door of the heretics and they all left. And uh, John Craig went with his heretic colleagues to an inn. When they were at the inn, some distance from Rome, they were overtaken by a party of soldiers sent to recapture them and bring them back to prison. And as the captain began to bind them, he looked into John Craig's face and said, didn't you at one time help a wounded soldier some years ago, a poor wounded soldier in this neighborhood? And John Craig said, I don't recall, sir. And the man said, I was that soldier and I recognize your face. You helped me. So I'm going to let you go. I'll take all the other heretics back to prison and I will treat them with leniency for your sake. And I'm so grateful to you because you spared my life. I'm giving you all the money I have. So the captain gave the money to John Craig. John Craig used the money to escape from all the precincts of of Rome and get out of Italy. But... His money ran out and he was left abandoned before he could escape and uh, became very depressed. God fed him 
by a meal a raven brought him, much like Elijah, and still he couldn't escape the country. And he was laying down in the grass, full of gloomy apprehensions, when a dog came running up to him with a purse in its teeth. Suspecting some evil, he tried to get rid of the dog. The dog dropped the purse and ran away. He opened the purse and found a sum of money. That carried him to Vienna beyond the escape of the tyranny of Rome. That's providence looking forward. <laughs> providence looking backward. Let me tell you, I'm sure Dr. Piper could tell many of these stories at Greenville too. Let me, let me tell you a story looking backward. I, I was just thinking about this story last night. Leonard Katundu is from Malawi, Africa. He is now president of five seminaries in a denomination that oversees close to five million people. He's basically the unspoken leader in that denomination. His influence is just tremendous. He's a godly, humble man. In God's providence, Leonard was appointed to that position nine days after he graduated from our seminary when he returned to Malawi. During this seminary training, he was a model student, godly, humble. God used the seminary to train him by leaps and bounds. He made progress. And so I was thinking last night, if God had not deposed me from my denomination in 1993, this seminary would not exist. Leonard Katundu never would have come to America. He never would have got his position leading five million people and five seminaries. And going back further, if God hadn't stopped me when I was a teenager and converted me, I never would have become a minister in the first place. And then going back and saying, well, when I was 14 years old, I had a very strange experience where I was in Yellowstone National Park and we couldn't find our keys and I, we looked all over. We had to find the keys to make it all the way to Rock Valley, Iowa that evening. And I, we, we turned up the mattresses. We couldn't find them anywhere. My brother and his friend went into the woods to look for a stick to try to pry open the trunk because we were sure the tr keys were in the trunk. I went back inside the tent, fell on my knees, begged God to show me where they were. I got off my knees. There was something hard underneath my knees. There they were. I then got in the car, and my whole life was changed at that moment. God was real for me for the first time in my life. I became a lost sinner before God. I came back home. I told my friends I couldn't, I couldn't be friends with them for a while because I had to be in the word of God. I was a lost sinner hanging over the pit of hell, and I had to find God. So I was thinking last night, laying in bed, if those keys had not been missing... Leonard Katundu would not be in Malawi in his position now. Now, that may seem radical to you, but what I'm saying is providence is a whole string of things, and when you look back, you see it like the back of the works of a watch, one wheel going this way, one wheel going that way, but they all work together so that God's decree is timed perfectly. Every second of the clock is ticking. He's doing his will that he's decreed from all eternity. So that's one way of looking at providence and saying, just tell stories backward and forward, and you have the doctrine of providence. Well, there's more to say, of course. And what I want to do in this hour is I want to build a definition with you, piece by piece, until we have a, a rather full definition by the end of the hour. Divine providence is introduced to us, first of all, in Genesis 22, 7 and 8. Abraham, as you know, has been commanded to offer his son Isaac for a burnt offering. And on their way to the place of sacrifice, Isaac says, well, here's the fire, here's the wood, Father, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. How did Abraham know that? 
Well, because of God's covenant promise to him. I will be a God to thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting God, everlasting covenant to be a God to thee and to thy seed after thee. So Abraham knew because of the covenant keeping grace of God that God would provide for his every need for soul and body for this life and for a better. And that God would lead him all the way along through this earthly pilgrimage to the heavenly country whose city, whose builder and maker is God. The God of salvation, the God of the covenant, is the God who provides. And that promise of the covenant of grace, of course, is sealed to us in baptism. In the words of the Dutch Reformed Form for the Administration of Baptism, we read this, When we are baptized in the name of the Father, God the Father witnesses and seals unto us that he does make an eternal covenant of grace with us and will provide us with every good thing and avert all evil or turn it to our profit. And so as Abraham's genuine seed, a believing offspring today, through God's converting grace, we who are believers can look to God to govern our lives, to provide all that we need, to deliver us from evil, and to bring us safe at last to the Father's home. And so from this simple story, profound story, beautiful story, we begin to build our doctrine of providence. Let me do it this way. The foundation of providence is God being God. God being God. Doing doing what we can trust him to do for us. Knowing who he is as a covenant-keeping God and knowing what he has promised to us. That's the beginning, the foundation. It's in the very nature and being of God. And that's how the Heidelberg Catechism approaches this doctrine so beautifully. Already in question 26, in Lord's Day 9, it tells us who God is. And we turn to that now. We turn really to theology proper, as we call it in systematics, the doctrine of God, to understand the doctrine of God's providence. And in the Catechism, what we're doing is we're listening to the voice of the church as the mother of believers instructing her children from the scripture, be it the Westminster Standards, the three forms of unity, these great confessions tell us what to believe, how to think about it, how to live out our faith from day to day based on the holy scriptures. And in churches today where catechisms and confessions are not used, the voice of our spiritual mother is at least somewhat stifled, and we suffer for the lack of her good instruction. And that's one of the beauties of the Heidelberg Catechism in particular. Every single phrase in the entire catechism has scriptural support, purposely. They wanted the catechism to just be a summary of Bible teaching. And so Lord's Day 9, beginning the Apostles' Creed, the exposition of the Apostles' Creed, takes up the first article, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. And it answers the question, who is, who is God? And the answer is, first, he is the eternal father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth with all that is in them, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel, and providence. So the catechism picks up the idea of providence in the very definition of who God is. And it lays bare the roots of divine providence. Creation, preservation, and government. These are the great works of God, and they form the context for understanding his greater work of redemption. Now notice The catechism's treatment of providence naturally follows the discussion of God as creator of maker of heaven and earth. When an artist 
completes a work of art. He puts it somewhere, doesn't he? If he does a painting, he'll hang it on a wall. He'll leave it, he'll turn his back on it, and he'll soon forget it. But when God created the earth, there was, as it were, no place for him to hang it. So what did he do with it? Well, Job tells us, Job 26, 7, he stretches out the north over the empty place and he hangs the earth upon nothing. Think about that. Herman Bavink said the earth and everything that God created, he hangs on nothing. That means he suspended the earth, as it were, upon himself because he is omnipresent. And so metaphorically speaking, all of creation rests in his hands. Today, he still holds the world in his hands. And he infuses its whole creation continuously with divine energy. If God would act like an artist and turn his back on his handiwork, the earth would soon fall into utter chaos. If he were to drop the earth out of his fatherly hand, it would fall into the abyss of nothingness. But he doesn't do this. He can't do this. It is not according to the character of God our Father to do this. And so, creation and providence are intimately related in several ways. Decretally, providence is the execution of God's eternal decree in the time and space of his creation. Historically, providence or preservation began immediately after God finished his creation. There's a logical transition, you see, from making the world to maintaining the world. Metaphysically, creation and providence are intimately related because the world has no independent existence. Independence for a created thing, said Bavink, is tantamount to non-existence. So God made everything. He made everything out of nothing, ex nihilo. Either out of nothing literally or out of things totally unrelated to what were made. And so God is the only eternally existent being. Beside God, creation is based on nothingness. Providence is simply a continuation of the creation in preservation. And teleologically, as we'll see in more detail in a moment, providence is the continued power to direct creation to, to direct creation to God's predetermined appointed end. And so that makes providence an overarching doctrine that greatly impacts our lives. Every single second of our lives is permeated by this doctrine of providence. You can't blink your eyes without the providence of God. You can't lift a finger without the providence of God. Now, second, the Catechism then goes on to say that this same creating and providing God is for the sake of Christ, notice that in question 26, for the sake of Christ, his Son, my God and my Father. I just love these words. The personal pronouns. You know, Luther said, all true religion is grounded in personal pronouns. This is the grammar of spirit-worked, appropriating faith. This is the grammar of amazing, stupendous grace. The holy creator who made the world out of nothing, who holds it in his hand, who's above the world, stoops so low that he becomes a personal God and father to polluted sinners like you and me. What grace is this? What a wonder. The almighty God, the father of a child of dust, the exalted creator, the father of the bruised reed, the God of wisdom, the father of a fool like you and me, the purely righteous God, the father of an unrighteous sinner, the spotless God, the father of a hell-worthy sinner. If you're a believer sitting here tonight, you are an adopted child of the living God of heaven and earth. This is amazing. You have all the rights and privileges in common with Christ as the eternal, natural Son of God. You are the adopted sons of God. This is grace. Pure grace. And what does faith do then with the exercise of these rights and privileges? 
while the catechism goes on and says that the believer trusts in God. Look at 26c. To provide me with all things necessary for soul and body. And further, that he will make whatever evils he sends upon me. And this veil of tears turn out to my advantage. And the catechism then says, this wholehearted confidence in divine providence is justified by clinging to two great undeniable facts. The end of question 26. He is able to do it being almighty God, and he is willing being a faithful father. So now we can add a little bit to our definition, can't we? We can say this, divine providence is God being God in the exercise of his omnipotence and in the demonstration and outworking of his fatherly goodness. In a sense, we could stop right here. And yet the catechism says more. There's more that needs to be said, it tells us. Because you see, in times of prosperity, the devil tells us to forget God and treasure our blessings as the fruits of our own toil. And in times of adversity, the world mocks us for our faith in God, and the devil tells us to curse God and to die in despair. In the practical realities of daily living, the devil is always challenging the doctrine of God's providence. So we need to know more about what is in this providence. More from our spiritual mother in the catechism. And so what question 27 does is it sets before us three things as it properly now defines providence. We, it sets before us, first of all, the identity of the essence of divine providence. We'll look at that. Then it pinpoints, secondly, the instrument by which that providence is exercised. We'll look at that. And third, the survey of the scope of its reach, touching all areas of life. So let's pull apart question 27 a moment and look at all three parts. First, then, the essence of providence. You know, the word providence is only used once in the Bible. And then it refers to a civil administration of a Roman governor in Acts 24. But the verb provide is used many times, and the idea of God providing is found on nearly every page of the Bible. Actually, the idea of providence is used in all kinds of various terms, like making alive, renewing, seeing, observing, saving, protecting, preserving, leading, teaching, ruling, upholding. It's everywhere in the scriptures. Now in the Bible, providence actually means, or the words that are synonyms of providence, to foreknow or to give what is necessary. When you combine these meanings, what's happening is God's providence is not just a knowledge of what's going to take place, but actually providing the power that is necessary to preserve and govern everyone and everything to reach the ordained end of God for God's own glory and for the good of his people. And that's why the Heidelberg Catechism defines providence here as the almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures according to his eternal counsel. And so what you see here, implicit, is all kinds of attributes of God coming into play. And you try to get your arms around them, they're too big for you. But we must think here in terms of God's omnipotence, the God who can do all things. God's omnipresence, the God who fills all things. God's omniscience, the God who knows all things. God's eternality and immutability, the ever-living God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and controls all things. These attributes are what makes God to be God. They make him unique, unlike any other being in the universe. And the catechism, as it were, rolls them up into one great power of God, put to work for the salvation and the well-being of his people. Divine providence is therefore the catalog of all the great works of God from first to last, from creation to the end of the world, which show that he is God alone and gets all the glory. 
And so God is present in his almighty power. Zacharias or Sinus, the author, major author of the catechism, says God is so powerful that it is not possible that anything can be done which he does not simply wish. Whatever is done must necessarily be done according to his will and his direction. That's a side blow against deism, of course. But it's also a comfort for believers. This almighty power is the source of all power in the world. No one can do anything apart from God's decreed providence. But not only is God almighty in his power, he's everywhere in his power, says the catechism. It talks about the distribution of God's power in this world. He's the ever-present, almighty power of this world. Today we hear people talk about luck, chance, coincidence, fate, alignment of the planets or stars, karma. Mother Nature helped them, they say. Or from a more scientific perspective, we hear words like chaos and random. Science today prides itself on knowing how things happen, but can't explain why they happen. And in flippant passing, people say, thank God, when something goes their way. Well, this is not the language of the Bible, nor the language of our catechism. You see, a common thought today among those that confess that God has almighty power is that he doesn't have omnipresent power. That he doesn't exert this power in a comprehensive fashion. The fact that God knows the blades of grass. The fact that God knows the number of the hairs of your head. The fact that God knows all the details of your life. People think it's preposterous. But the Bible says, this is the way it is. Not a sparrow can fall to the ground without his will. All creatures, question 28 says, are so in his hand that without his will, they cannot so much as move. So nothing comes to us by chance. Providence is everywhere. God is and God is everywhere. God has a monopoly on power. He works through means, yes. But he is the one behind all the means. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. This is what the catechism means by these two doctrines of providence. Preservation. Every moment you're preserved by God. Government. God guides and leads every single thing. So now our definition is bigger. Here it is. For the believer, divine providence is God being God, doing what we can to trust Him to do for us by means of His providences and promises through which he exercises his omnipotence and government in his fatherly attributes, such as goodness, wisdom, sovereignty, righteousness, holiness, and love, such that he orders all issues and all events in this world after the counsel of his will to his glory. How does he do it? What's the instrument he uses? Well, the catechism addresses that as well. It speaks of the hand of God three times. The hand of God at work for us. Now, that's a very expressive and apt metaphor because the hand represents skill and strength and compassion. With a skillful hand, the carpenter builds a great house. With a strong hand, the warrior wields a deadly weapon to destroy the enemy. With a compassionate hand, a caregiver nurses the sick and feeds the hungry. And the Bible makes a great deal of this metaphor. Do you know the Bible speaks of the hand 1,800 times? And 1,300 of those times are metaphorically. The hand was considered by ancient peoples to be one of the most important parts of the body and still is in some ways. But it was everywhere in ancient society. Even the measuring stick was hand breadth. Figuratively, the hand came to symbolize power. In Joshua 8.20, it is translated as strength. Clasping hands together meant friendship. Seating someone on your right hand meant favor. Clean hands symbolized innocence. Striking hands sealed the bargain. Lifting the hand symbolized violence. Folded hands 
symbolize supplicatory prayer. Hands, the Bible teaches us, were used to express gladness, humility, grief, generosity. When Israel went out of Egypt with a high hand, the reference is to the hand or to the help of the Lord. Now, 250 of those 1,800 times, the word hand is used in reference to God's hand, even though God has no literal hand. And the majority of those uses refer to his powerful, caring, intimate providence. I mentioned already Fred, Fred, Lee's, Fred Lee's book. He has chapters on God's hand that creates, God's hand that governs, God's hand that provides, redeems, keeps, guides, chastens, blesses, enables, and judges. Ten chapters in his book. This is his whole book. The hand of God. It's everywhere in the Bible. And I can't go through them all, but let me just do the Psalms. I'll just tell you some of the Psalms. God's hand is strong and highly exalted, Psalm 89. His hand creates all things and they remain in His hand as His possession, Psalm 19, Psalm 95. The hand of God is open to satisfy the desire of every living thing, 145. The works of God's hands make His people glad and they triumph in Him, 92. Whereas the wicked are punished because they disregard the operation of God's hands, Psalm 28. The hand of God upholds the believer. Psalm 37. The hand of God is lifted up to defend the humble. Psalm 10. The hand of God safeguards the life of the believer. Psalm 35. Orders all things for his salvation. Verse 15. The hand of God chastens the believer as a father chastens his son. Psalm 32. The hand of God rests upon Christ as his anointed king and savior to confirm and uphold him in his offices and secure the victory of his kingdom. Psalm 80. God exercises His providence through the instrumentality of what Scripture calls His hand. The functions, the personality of God in all the ways a hand functions in the life of a human being. And it's interesting that our forefathers often spoke of the right hand of God's favor, based on the biblical data that right hand was favorable over against the left hand of God's forbearance. And you know Calvin and other reformers make a great deal of this. They say something like this. Everyone is the subject of God's providence. Everyone receives good things from the hand of God. But the unbeliever receives it from the left hand of his forbearance. He's storing up wrath for the day of wrath. It's a blessing now in a certain way, but only temporary. And one day it will testify against him if he doesn't repent and believe the gospel. But the believer receives everything through the right hand of God's favor in and through Jesus Christ. That's why Calvin said, only the believer truly enjoys whatever providence gives him in this world. He can look at his uh, wife and say, she's a gift to me from God through Jesus Christ. Children, house, today, car, possessions. Calvin even said, only the believer can enjoy the furniture in his home God has given him because he sees it coming to him through the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So the beauty, you see, of the instrumentality of providence is that a believer learns to live responsibly and sees everything he has, everything he does, everything he can do, everything he possesses, everything that's ever come his way, it all comes to him through the loving hand of his heavenly Father, through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we've got to add one more thing to our definition. Here it is. For the believer... Divine providence as God, being God, doing what He can to trust Him to do for us by means of His promises in and through Christ, through which He exercises His omnipotence and government and His fatherly goodness, wisdom, and so on, to His own glory. But that leaves one thing yet not mentioned. What about the scope of all this? Well, Catechism says at the end of question 27, all things come not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. Everything. We can't put any limit on what God does in the operation of His providence. 
And so what the Reformers are saying in this catechism is that there's a catalog of what we call the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, the ebbing and the flowing, the good and the bad of life, and all of these things come to us through the hand of God. And so they mention them, don't they, in question 27. Herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things, all things, come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. So the Catechism lists six pairs of things as illustrations of the fact that every detail of our lives is ordered by God. Some pairs seem to be characterized by synonymous words representing seemingly insignificant phenomena, herbs and grass. Some are characterized by complementary ideas, suggesting things quite necessary, meat and drink. Others are antonymous ideas, good and evil things, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, health and sickness, riches and poverty. This isn't an exhaustive list. This is just saying everything, everything. Even sin and unbelief and death and eternal punishment are subject to God's governance. Classic text here often used, of course, is Joseph's when he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So for his people, God uses every single thing for their good. All things work together for good to them that love God, to the called according to his purpose. And so what this brings is the last element of providence that our forefathers spoke of. They spoke of preservation, government, and then this thing they called cooperation or concurrence. And the simplest way of explaining that, it's the most challenging one, but the simplest way of explaining that is that as you walk down life's pathway, every step you take meets at every step the divine decree in such a way that the divine decree is worked out in providence at every step you take without God ever intermixing himself with any of your sin. You freely, voluntarily sin. God does not force you to sin. You sin of your own free agency. But at every step you take, your actions are concurring with God's sovereign eternal decree. And so providence brings your actions You're 100% responsible. And God's sovereignty, God is 100% sovereign together. So that mysteriously, wondrously, beyond our comprehension, God's will is always being done. That is his secret will. It's always being done. Now that may raise the question, if God governs over everything... What about this relationship to sin? Well, there's a lot to say about it, and I know other topics will address it, so I'll be very brief here. But let me say this. God hates sin, and yet he sovereignly decreed sin. He providentially directs sin. He justly allows sin. And at every step of the way, we must say that sin is dastardly, heinous. It's spiritual insanity. It's bad, bad, bad from our side, but from God's side, it too, I say it with reverence, humble reverence, is included in his sovereign will for some of the very reasons that Dr. Shaw has already mentioned. So we need to remember that through the providence of God and divine concurrence, God gives the sinner the power, the consideration, and the choice to act against the commandments of God And yet we always do so willingly, freely, voluntarily, without any persuasion from God's secret decree or from his providence. God's providence, therefore, can be defined this way. And this is the final definition I give you. For the believer, divine providence is God being God, doing what we can to trust him to do for us by means of his promises in and through Christ, through which he exercises his omnipotence, his concurrence, and his government in his fatherly goodness, wisdom, sovereignty, righteousness, holiness, and love 
such that he orders all issues and all events in this world, including even the most inconsequential, after the counsel of his will, to his own glory. And what I'm saying to you, dear friends, is this is a beautiful doctrine. And I want to tell you why it's beautiful. Why it's beautiful. In my concluding remarks to you this evening, first of all, it's a beautiful doctrine to meditate upon. How do you learn to meditate on God's providence? Well, John Flavel addresses that subject in his classic, The Mystery of Providence. He, he basically says four things. Work hard, number one, at remembering and exploring the providence of God towards you. Remember what God has done. And don't just stay in the surface of your life. Dig down, he says. Let not your thoughts swim like feathers upon the surface of the water, he says, but sink like lead to the bottom. Remember the pit from which you've been digged. And praise God for his leadings over you. Number two, trace the connection between the providences of God in your life and the promises of God in his word. Notice where he fulfills his promises. And praise God for his beauty and his glory in these things. And three, look beyond the events and circumstances of providence to God as the author and provider. He takes up Calvin's thought, never only look at secondary causation, but always go to the primary causation. And wow, does that ever help you when you can actually do that? You know, you come home from a bad session meeting or bad consistent meeting and you think, oh, that, that elder, he, he should have said this. He, he said that wrong. I'm offended by that. And you're looking all at secondary causation. If you could just go home from a bad consistent meeting and say, you know what? Everything that was said tonight, even though some of it may have been sinful, it's ordered by God. And even the criticisms leveled at me have been by divine decree and in God's providence to do me good. You could go to sleep a lot easier. You see, there's something beautiful about surrendering everything to the providence of God and trusting him. And then fourth, respond, says Flavel, to each providence in an appropriate way. If God's love is that the heart of his providence towards you as a believer, God's heart is so full of love that while his face may frown, his heart is full of love to you. And once you grasp that, you see, you view everything differently. I have a man in my church who, 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 was, who just about lost his leg. He was back in the hospital four or five times, every time struggling with his knee. There was infection, then there was infection again. Surgery, surgery, surgery. And he just felt so sorry for the brother. But he just kept saying, it's my father's will. My father has more lessons to teach me. What a blessing. What a blessing to be able to, to say that. I've got a young, young lady right now in her 30s, her husband, got in a serious car accident in our church. And he came out of the coma not so long ago. He recognizes people now, but that's about it. Says a few words. At best, whispering. And uh, can move his hand a little bit. Do a few little things. It's improving a little bit. This has been going on for a year. This woman has a daily blog. Thousands of people are reading her blog. She's walking by faith, trusting God's providence. And her life and the life of her husband is a testimony to thousands. Just before he got in the accident, he said to her, I wish I could go be a missionary somewhere. I'll tell you, he is being a missionary right now in his condition through his wife's blogs. God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. We need to learn to begin to look at things, as Dr. Shaw said, from a glorious perspective, from God's perspective, from the perspective of eternity, not time, not earthy. Well, that's the foundation of the beauty of providence. Let me show you how that works its way out quickly in several different ways. Number one, the beautiful blessing of providential magnitude. Do you understand how beautiful this is? That there's nothing untouched by providence. So everything that ever happens in my life is in God's control and meant for my good means I must let God be God. And when I let God be God, I have true peace. Martin Luther said, letting God be God is more than half of all true religion. 
What a glorious thing. What a beautiful thing this is. The longer I live on earth, the more faith I have in providence, and the less faith I have in my interpretation of providence, wrote Jeremiah Day. You don't have to understand it all. You just have to trust the God who gives it. Number two, the beautiful blessing of providential power. Isn't it a glorious thing that a Christian knows that God is in complete control, dictates, guides, leads every detail of my life, and that his power is absolute? Satan is mighty, but he's only a fallen angel. My Lord sits on the king. He's king, sits on the holy hill of Zion. The Bible calls providence a fort, a tower, a stronghold, a sure defense, an almighty arm, a valiant hand. We're okay. We're going to be okay in the hand of God. When I get very nervous before I preach sometimes, or when I get very tossed about with satanic temptations and harassments, and my wife feels it, she senses it, she often says to me on the way to work, or the way to, well, way, way to work, <laughs> the way to church. That is my work. <laughs> my vocatio, really. She says to me, it's okay, honey. He'll help you one more time. It's in his hands. It's in his hands. It's okay. The church will prosper. He'll provide strength for this one more occasion. The church's enemies will not prevail. Because he's almighty. And he'll overrule every evil, every intended evil, with his intended good. Number three, the beautiful blessing of providential purpose. This is, this is just awesome. This is so beautiful. That a Christian gets to live for something so big as the God of the universe. I was traveling to South Africa a few months ago, sat next to a Jewish a woman and got in a long dialogue with her. Went on for hours, actually. And uh, she believed in God. She wasn't sure if she believed in the afterlife. She wasn't sure if, if, if she'd ever see God. And I said to her, you know, what if I'm right and you're wrong? She said, well, if you're right and I'm wrong, she said, you're going to get the better end of the deal. So, well, but you can know God too. Well, I just can't believe he's, he's that... He's that personal, she said. I said, well, tell me, just tell me. Um, I don't mean to pry, but what is life all about to you? What is your big goal in life? She thought for a moment. She said, you know, I've got two daughters. If I could just pass on my morals to my two daughters, I'll be satisfied with my life. It nearly took my breath away. And I took a very deep breath and I said, I, I, I hope I, I don't want to sound condescending to you. Please forgive me if I do in any way. I don't want to offend you in any way. What I want to say to you as a Christian, as a Christian, we live for the God of the universe. We live far beyond the needs of our children, though they're precious to us. We, we, we live to extol and exalt and glorify. I said, pardon me for saying it, but, but your life seems so small to me. The purpose of your life is so small. The morals of your daughter, just for this life. My purpose is to exalt the God and live solely deo gloria for here and forever hereafter. You see, when you have the God of providence as your God, and you understand the magnitude and the purpose of what he's doing, life is very meaningful. You don't need to despair. Samuel Rutherford said, I adore and kiss all the providences of my God who knows well what is best for me and expedient for me in all things. That is beautiful. And you can live that way. Number four, the beautiful blessing of providential Christology. Too many writers, even reform writers, disconnect providence from Christology. I think that's very wrong. I understand that with regard to the unbeliever to a certain extent. But to the believer, Christ and providence are interwoven. Spurgeon said the keys of providence swing upon the girdle of Christ. He's everything, you see. It's all about Christ. 
caring for me. The love of God for his own children in Christ Jesus is incomprehensible. The fatherly hand of God's providence is turned to me because the pierced hands of Christ suffered for me and died for me. And because he died for me, he lives for me. And if he died for me, is it too much for me to live for him? And so you see, providence brings me to Christ. And from Christ, I want to live wholly and solely for him. Then there's the beautiful blessing of providential tenderness. Obadiah Sedgwick says it so beautifully in his book. He says, God relates providentially to his church in tender, familiar terms. He relates to her as a father, relates to his firstborn. Jeremiah 31, as a mother to her sucking child. Isaiah 49, as a shepherd to his sheep. Jeremiah 31, as a friend to an intimate friend. Song of Solomon 5. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. God is powerful, but he's also tender. I read not so long ago of an article that said, what women are most looking for in men is someone who's strong and tender. Well, that's what every believer has in the Lord Jesus Christ in perfection. He's strong. He's tender. He cares for them. God keeps his own as the apple of his eye. He hovers over us like an eagle, hovers over her young, and bears us up on his wings. What a comfort. What beautiful yearnings the church have to a beautiful, providential God. And then there's a beautiful blessing of providential security. Security, both in his reign and for our good. William Plummer said, God rules and overrules. God's government will never fail in any part of the world, in any event of life, or in any tumult of the nations. We need never fear that God will be dethroned or overreached or defeated. We live in awful days, in many ways. With the immorality going on in America today, the advances of the gay lobbying movement, war on every hand, terrorism around the world, we could have lots of fears, but heaven doesn't panic. John Newton says, though troubles assail and dangers affright, though friends should all fail and foes all unite, Yet one thing secures us, whatever betide, the scripture assures us, the Lord will provide. And then there's a the beautiful blessing of providential constancy. God's providence never shuts its eye to our needs. He never sleeps, he never slumbers. Like the Father and the Son who author it, providence works hitherto and shall work. And by means of providence, God goes on working and the church will continue working out of his working and the covenant will continue working out of his promises and providences. And as a result, remarkable instances of providences will continue to abound. I told you about John Craig and Leonard Katundu, but you all have your own story about big things, about small things. Every day, God is adding to his constancy in his beautiful providence in your life. And blessed are believers who have an eye to see it. And you have an eye to see it you will be a thankful, hopeful, secure, tender-hearted, loving Christian like your Father in heaven. And finally, the beautiful blessing of providential hope. No matter how the situation appears at present, no matter what trials you're going through today, God will have the last word. You know, when I went through some awful trials in my life, that I didn't think would ever end. And they were hard. And I know what it means to cry out to the living God from the depths of the soul for mercy and for help. I know what it means sometimes not to be able to get beyond the word Lord. I just appeal to him to pray for me who sits at the Father's right hand when I can no longer even pray. I can't even get the words out because the pain is so intense. But in all those years, God kept impressing upon me this one verse, there shall surely come an end and your expectation shall not be cut off. The hand of providence will have the last word. There's always hope. There's always hope with God. So take thought. Take heart. 
from this beautiful, beautiful doctrine of divine providence. Don't vex your mind with worries and fears that providence will desert you. It never will. Wait on providence, contentedly. Wait on providence, quietly. Wait on providence, humbly. Wait on providence with abounding hope. And always remember, kind providence will never die. Because God is God. And God will be our God and will be our guide even unto death and unto life eternal. For Christ's sake. Soli Deo Gloria. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we thank thee so much for thy providence. We thank thee for its glorious, broad-sweeping definition. We thank thee for its practical beauty in every area of our lives. We thank thee that its doctrine, Lord, defines who thou art, and through that definition defines who we are. But, O oh God, we pray, help us not to abuse this providence. Help us not to trample it underfoot or to be ungrateful for it. Help us not to act like unbelievers or to be unbelievers. Save us from shallow views of providence and help us to base our lives on Christological providence and to find in thee the strength, the motivation, the joy, the security, the power, the hope, everything we need to live in comfort and to die in peace to the glory of God triune. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.